So with a parameterized query, the where clause gets filled in with somewhere to say specifically what we want. Because it's pretty rare for us to want every single thing from a table. I'm not saying it never happens, but a lot of times we want to we want to somehow filter it. So we don't want to see every single call in our hypothetical call center. We just want to see um, like um, you know uh, calls for a specific customer. All right. So let's review a select statement and let's talk a little bit about parameterized queries. And we'll we'll create a couple more a couple different ways. All right. The basic query statement is a select statement. And a select statement looks like this. Select. Then you have a list of columns from, and then you have a list of tables. That's like the bare minimum, all right, that you'd have. Select some columns from some tables, table or tables. If you want everything from a table, you can just say star. So select star from customer would give me a list of every column from the customer table. Now the order that it comes in, the best way to think about it is if you don't specify an order, the database is going to give it to you in whatever order it feels like. All right. Um, it, you may be able to make sense of it. All right. There, there might be some rhyme or reason like for example, typically it might be like in primary key order, but you shouldn't depend on that. All right? <coughs> if you want it in a specific order, you should explicitly put it in a specific order by um, an order by clause. So this is the basic syntax of a select statement, and then we can add extra clauses on it to do additional things. All right? And one of them is an order by clause. So I could say order by customer name. Or I could do a combination of columns. Order by state customer name. And if I did that, it would show all the A states first. So what would alphabetically be the first state? Alabama. It would show Alabama. So within Alabama, the customers would be sorted in alphabetical order. Then it would show Alaska, Alaska or Arkansas, one of the two. Yeah. And it would show that, actually Alaska would probably be the first. I, I, you know, it doesn't matter, right? Whatever order it's in, it would be in that order. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then, but within that, it would be sorted in alphabetical order. All right. Um, by default, the order is ascending from lowest to highest. And so in the case of alphanumeric fields like name or state, that's the same as alphabetical order. All right. Um, if it's number, it would be in numeric order. So one, two, three, four, and so on. If it's date, it would be chronological order from the earliest date to the latest date. So by default, it's ascending. So it gets higher the, the further down you go. You can reverse it if you wanted to. You know, having a last name of Z, I'm always at the end of the list, right? So maybe, you know, if I were to take over control of things, which, you know, do remember there's a presidential election next year, so I'm, I'm still debating my options here. Um, you can put it descending order. And you put descending order by putting DESC. That means descending. So that would be from highest to lowest. So the Z's would be on top going down through the A's. Now, this is an important uh, thing to note. So, you know, I mention that because, you know, sometimes you want to sort things in descending order. All right? Like if you wanted a list of people from the youngest to the oldest, you'd want to do it in descending order. But it's important for another reason, too. DESC is you know, a reserved word. It has a special meaning to SQL. Therefore, don't call any of your columns DESC. All right? Because you could do it, 
but then you need to put square brackets around it everywhere. Otherwise, it would recognize it as an error. I usually don't tempt fate, and I would not call a column DESC. Just like I wouldn't call a column select from order, that's a, another likely possibility, by not quite so likely, but so on. But be aware of the reserved words in SQL, all right? And don't name any of your columns or tables, those things, because you're asking for trouble. All right. Now, if we only want to see certain customers, I'll erase the order by for now. We can put a where clause in. Where state equals Ohio, for example. And that would give us everyone whose state was equal to Ohio. All right. We can compound conditions. All right. So we could say where state equals Ohio and <coughs> city equals Cleveland. So I'm pretty sure there's other Clevelands in the country. I think there's like a Cleveland, Mississippi or something. Yeah. yeah. So therefore, I could combine them. And with an and, remember, both parts of the condition have to be true for it to be true. So this would pick up anything with a city of state, but only those that had a, a city of Cleveland, rather, but only those that had a state of Ohio. One thing that is useful is approximate matches, especially when you're searching. So... Let's say you don't, let's say you, you had a query by customer name. Or customer name equals Zellers. Remember, all these constants, all these things I'm showing hard coded here, are going to be replaced by parameters in our application because we're probably not going to write a page specifically to show me and specifically to show other customers. We're going to write a generic page that will, that will take a parameter from somewhere and show people that match that. So customer name equals Zellers would be great if I happen to know the exact customer name and the exact spelling of the customer name. All right. You know, there, there's people that misspell my name all different kinds of ways, right? Z-E-L-L-E-R, Z-E-L-L-A-R-S, and so on. All right? So you might not be sure exactly how to spell my name, or if we were looking up a customer on our call center. Um, so what you can do is you can put an approximate search in. And the approximate search is, instead of customer equal, you'd say customer like, <coughs> then you use a percentage sign to indicate that there, that's a wild card. Is there an equal in between there? No. 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 It's just the word like. Like becomes the operator. So that will do an approximate search, all right? So that would match Zellers, E-R-S, Z-E-L-L-A-R-S, Z-E-L-L-E-R, Z-E-L-L-A-H, and all the way down the line, all right? So anything that started with Z-E-L-L, -L. all right? Yeah, Google does all sorts of stuff, right? Yeah. And, and, and in fact, you know, um, you know, there, there's a whole thing of, you know, using Google as spell check, right? You, you go and search for something and, and type in what you, how you think it's spelled, it will tell you, do you mean this? And it's like, yeah, I do mean that as a matter of fact. All right. 
But yeah, they do all kinds of stuff there. But yeah, a lot of searches are good. And again, it depends on the specific thing that you're after. Like, you probably want to use this for state, right? For state, you know, you want to be able to type in. You know, it's, it's rare that you'd want people that lived in states that started with O, right? <laughs> you know, you know OH or OK or are there other states that start with O? Whatever, all right? Um, Whereas with name, it's very possible. Or like titles of books, you know. I, I mean, you know, you don't want to force someone to type in some long exact spelling with the correct punctuation, you know. Like, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, Harry Potter 1, Harry Potter and the big evil guy with no nose. All right. You wouldn't want to get the exact spelling of it correct, right? Because that could be difficult. You know, there could be punctuation in there. It could be dashes or colons or whatever. So you wouldn't want to do that. But you might want to just be able to search for Harry Potter and have that stuff come up. Now, you can place a wild card wherever you want to, um, and it depends on the context of of where you would put it. Like, for example, with names, a lot of times, you know you know that it probably starts with a certain character string. So with names, it would probably make sense to put the wild card after. But if you're looking for a title of a book, you might want to put if you want to find all the books that had geometry in the title. That would put the wild card before and after, so it would match if geometry appeared anywhere in the title of the book. Now, we can also join things together. All right, we can also join tables together. And we can do that with a where clause. And this is kind of what we did last time, if my memory is right. We had a statement that looked like <coughs> this. Select star from customer call where customer name equals something and customer, customer ID equals call customer ID. Now again, you have to specify, if you have more than one table, you have to specify how they're linked up. Otherwise, it will give you what's called a cross product and it will match everything in the first table with everything in the last table, in the second table. And if you have three or four tables, it gets even crazier from there because it matches everything in the first table with every combination of everything from the second table and it matches those with every combination of the, you know, and it gets to be a mess. A good rule of thumb is if you do a query and you get a lot more rows than you expected, all right, then maybe your where clause isn't right or you're missing something in your where clause. As a general rule, if you have two tables together, there better be one thing in your where clause that joins them. If you have three things, there better be two things in your where clause that join them and so on down the line. All right, let's bring up the example we had last time. And we'll take a look at it, and then we'll branch out in other directions. Yes? So when you join the tables, you use table, and then the primary key of that table? Yes. Okay, and then? Uh, e equals another table. the other table dot, and it'll be the foreign key in that table. Oh, okay. All right. Because remember, the whole idea of a foreign key is it's a column in a table that points to the primary key of another table. So let me go and download last Thursday's example. We'll take a look at it and then we'll do a couple things with it.
blazing speed on this. Pardon me? I said I thought you were just looking at the home page. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I, this is... Could spend hours just staring at it. Notice something real quick, by the way, this doesn't really relate to this class, but more web design in general. Notice how this page has a very, very mobile look to it. In other words, it looks like it uses the mobile convention of the little, th you know, three lines here to indicate a menu and so on. I've seen, just within the past six months, I've seen a lot of websites go to this approach where the idea is, and again, that's, that's a design philosophy known as mobile first, where you think in terms of how, you, how it's going to look on a mobile device, and then maybe you add some extra stuff in it um, for a uh, desktop device. For example, I, I, was, uh, I was crying a lot earlier in the semester about the fact that that menu doesn't stay put. All right. Well, it does stay put kind of if the screen's too small. But if this window gets big enough, then that menu appears like right here. So um, again, that's something like they designed this with mobile in mind, but then they put that little additional feature that if you're on a really wide screen, it will show the menu all the time, which is kind of cool. there have not been more problems with Canvas. I don't know if I was talking with this class or another class about that, but Canvas is okay in my book. So let's go in and open the call center that we had from last time. And let's look at this guy. Let's look at this guy first, default. Default, I have a grid view and a SQL data source. Behind the SQL data source, there's a SQL statement. There always is, right? Now, if you remember back going a few classes, I made that SQL statement just by using sort of the query builder uh, that's built in here. There's still a SQL statement, all right? And again, the one thing I urge you is even if you use a query builder, you write your own SQL statement, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that probably doesn't matter because you do need to understand the SQL statement regardless. And you do need to know that if you want to see the SQL statement, you can go in here and find the SQL statement somewhere here. Select star from customer. All right. And again, that's probably the most basic SQL statement you can have. Our visual control then, we can go and we can assign to our visual control that SQL data source. So we bind the two together. So SQL data source fills up with all the relevant data that we've asked for. The grid view then is a visual representation of that. And again, you can, you can select things that you won't necessarily display on the grid. Uh, the ID is a good example of that. You don't always need to show the ID. All right. 
Uh, but you do need to select it just in case you need to make any updates. When we start talking about updates and deletes, um, having the ID is something that's important. So we will um, we'll, we'll oftentimes select the ID even if we don't show it. So this, if we go and run, we get this. every customer. It is in primary key order, but again, don't depend on that because you don't know. All right? It will give it to you in whatever, whatever order the database feel, uh, feels like. Um, the other one is the calls. And that one, we had a search, uh, a search field and a search button and here's where we use a parameterized query. I wrote the SQL statement myself, and it says select customer name, call date, description of problem from customer call, where customer call ID equals call.customer ID, and customer name equals question mark. And then I have order by customer name, call date time. Let me bring that into Notepad so we can take a closer look at it. Question mark means a parameter. And the parameter is something that we're going to fill in when we run this. I, I searched for it. There is a uh, there is uh, there's help for opening notepad. Let's just think about that for a second. <laughs> you know, that, I, well, I, I should, you know. I really don't like when technical people ha have, you know, cop and elitist attitude towards non-technical people. On the other hand, really, if you don't know how to open Notepad, are you going to know how to navigate through help to find out how to open Notepad? <laughs> All right. And again, the question mark indicates it's something that is going to get filled in at runtime. In other words, we don't always want the same customer name, right? We want the customer name that we're searching for. Who is the customer name that we're searching for? The one that we enter into the text box. So we want to make sure that the customer name matches the name in the text box. So if we look here, back in Visual Studio, on the very next screen, we say where that parameter comes from. All right? The question mark indicates that it's a parameter that's going to be supplied at runtime. The second screen defines the parameters. In other words, it says, hey, where are we going to get that? Where are we going to get that blank that we're filling in? All right? Think of the question mark as a blank that we're filling in at runtime. Well, we're going to get it from that text box field. All right, we're getting it from a control, and which control? We're getting it from the text box field. So now if we run this, I have to remember the names I used. Mary Johnson, Fred Smith, I think. Yeah. So now if we go and run this, and we type in Mary Johnson, and do a search, we get Mary's calls, we type in Fred, Smith, we get Fred's calls. Yes? So right now without a percent sign in there, if you just typed in Fred, would it bring up Fred Smith still? No, it wouldn't, because it would look for an exact match. Gotcha. There's no Fred. All right? So if we couldn't remember if it's Fred Smith spelled S-M, 
YTH or SMITH or whatever, then would be out of luck with this. Let's go and do that. Let's go and make it so that we can do an approximate search. All right. So how would we do that? First of all, would we make our change to the grid view or would we make our change to the SQL data source? The data source. And that's an important sort of <coughs> skill to have to recognize where you're going to make the change for. Uh, as a general rule, if you're, if you're changing the contents of the data being retrieved, that's the data source. If you're changing the way it's going to look like, that's the grid view. So, for example, if I wanted to add the customer city to that, provided that it was already in the data source, I would have to go in and add that to the um, grid view. So let's go and let's make this an approximate search. So I'm going to go configure the data source. Instead of equals, I'm going to say like question mark plus, and I put the percent in quotes, because I'm literally adding that, I'm adding that literal to there. So it would look like this. So whatever parameter I put in the text box is going to get put in the dollars, uh, in, I'm sorry, in the question mark, and then we're going to add a percent sign, so it's going to be like that. Now, because we put the percent sign only after our parameter, it's going to match Fred Smith, Fred Jones, Fred Washington, and so on. It's not going to match Joe Fredrickson because Fredrickson, the, the Fred, is in the middle of the string and not at the beginning of the string. So, let's go. It knows that you've changed the, um, it knows that you've changed the um, contents of the select, so it asks you if you want to redo the grid. In this case, we're going to say no because there's really nothing to redo. We just changed specifically what we're seeing. We didn't add columns or anything like that. So now we go in and we type in Fred and it should show us Fred Smith stuff. <coughs> there you go. It doesn't do um, caps for it. No, it's not case SQL as a rule is not case sensitive. I think there are ways, but you have to do it on a database level to say that you want to make it case sensitive. I, I, the default is it being case non, not case sensitive. But if you think about it, for the most part is good, right? Um, about the only way where that would be problematic is like if you want your password to be case sensitive. So if my password was password all in lowercase and I typed in password in uppercase, if I only used a select statement, it would say that they matched, which maybe you want. Maybe you don't want your password to be case sensitive. But if you did want it to be case sensitive, then you'd have to put in a few lines of code to actually check the case of it as well. Okay, so in this case, we are getting our parameter from the text box on this page. We're going to write a couple more parameterized queries, and I'm first going to describe what we're going to do, then we're going to talk about what we're going to do, and then we're going to go and do it. All right. I think that's a good approach to take. I mean, it's a good approach to take in a learning environment, right, to sort of give you a context, give you an overview of what we're going to do, and then talk a little bit about how it's going to work to sort of get your mind working, like how are we going to do this, and then actually go and do it. Because, 
again, you might have a vague idea how to do something, but we want to see how it's actually done. So you sort of take inventory. What parts of this do I know? What parts do I not know? All right, you sort of take a mental inventory as you're doing this. And then you can, you know, then, then, then you, how do I want to say it? Then you proper, properly frame the task. You know what it is you have to do. You know which parts of it you understand. You don't know, you know which parts you don't understand. Okay, so let's talk about what I want to do here. doing things a piece at a time, not doing everything. 
anything all at once. Because I think, I think it's pretty easy to do this. All right? Easy is in the eye of the beholder, right? But I think it's pretty easy to do this. Have a drop down with the names of the people. Have a button. Then show the customer data for the person that we picked. All right? I think that's fairly straightforward to do. All right? We've essentially done this. We've done a parameterized query. So this is going to have a SQL data source that's going to be a parameterized query. So this is going to be something like select star from customer where, where what? I have no idea, right? 
I actually do know, but we're pretending that I don't. You know, it's not too hard when you only have three customers at your table, right? I got a one out of three chance of getting it right, all right? So people aren't going to know those things, right? Now imagine if you were like registering for classes, which I think you can do now, right? Yeah. All right. So you're going to go in, I assume maybe you already have, but you're going to go in and you're going to say, I'm going to look and see what else Zellers is teaching next term, and I'm going to load up on those courses, all right? Or maybe you're going to say the opposite. I'm going to look and see what else Zellers is teaching so I know to avoid those courses, right? But either way, you're going to, you might do a search for Zellers, all right? Now, if my faculty ID number showed up there, that would be meaningless to you. Who knows what my faculty ID number is? I do and probably no one else. But my name you would recognize. Now, this is where a drop-down comes in handy. Because a drop-down, remember, for each entry in a drop-down, there's two pieces of data. There's what the user sees and what is sort of stored behind the scenes. So what are we going to make the user see? The name. What's going to be stored behind the scenes? The primary key, which is the ID. So let's go on and build this page. There's one last thing that's different about this, all right, before we go and build it. I, I forgot about that for a second. We're only having one customer, so we really don't need a grid, right? A grid is best when we have a list of things. In this case, we only have one customer. Well, there's another kind of view that we can use when we only have one of something, and that's called a details view. So we're going to use a details view instead of a grid view. Works the same. It's just oriented differently. Instead of having multiple rows, it just shows you one row from the data source, and it's stacked vertically instead of stacked horizontally. Um, our query, by definition, is only going to have one row, right? So therefore, um, that's not a problem. So let's go and let's build this. And we're going to build it a tiny piece at a time. So I'm going to go here. get so involved that like I wish I had a wider monitor like this really gets to be a problem like in the Android class because there's like 65 little panes in the window you know and I have to and it's kind of bad even here all right but we'll struggle through at least we're not on punch cards <laughs> so I'll go to new file web form and we'll call this Customer summary. That sounds like a nice name for this. Add. I'm going to set this to be my start page. And first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the drop down. So I will go here, create the drop down list. Now again, in the, in the, the previous examples we did, we went in manually and hard-coded all the items, and we put those in. But that's not going to work here, right? Because we don't want to have to maintain our database and maintain this, right? That's repeating ourselves. If it's in the database, we want to show there, all right? So I'm going to have this bound to a data source. So I'm going to click Choose Data Source. It's a new data source. It's a SQL database. Again, SQL database does not imply that it's a SQL server database. It can be an access database as well. Or it could be Oracle or anything. I'm going to give this a name. 
SQL data source list because um, that's, that's what this is. This is for the list of customers. That way I won't get confused between this data source and the other data source. All right, connection string. Remember, we want to pick our connection string. We don't want to have a second connection string. You only create the connection string once. Every other time, you simply refer to the connection string that you already defined in the web config file. In that way, if you needed to change something about it, um, even a drastic change, like changing it from an access database to an Oracle database, there'd only be one place that would have to go and change it. So I'm going to pick that connection string. Um, I'm going to pick, and I'm going to say select star from, well, let's say select customer ID, customer name from customer order by customer name. Next. Now there's no parameters in this. Why? Because we want a list of everything. And there we go. Now, the last step of this is where we connect that data source to the dropdown. And as I said before, a dropdown has two each entry of a dropdown, each option in a dropdown, has two pieces associated with it. One is the description that the user sees, the field that the user sees. And the other is what sort of the data field that's sort of stored behind the scene. So, select the data field to display in the dropdown list. Well, we don't want to show customer ID, right, because we don't really know what that means. All right, we don't know who customer number three is or whatever. We want to see their name. But behind the scenes, we want the value of this dropdown to be the customer ID. All right. So I'm going to go and put a button. Again, even if you use like the wizards and the graphical view to design it, it always pays to look at what got generated. Because I don't care how good the GUI is you're using, I don't care how good the IDE you're using is. There's going to be a point where you're going to need to look at the code and understand what it's doing and tweak something because the IDE or the GUI or whatever is doing things um, the way it wants to and not necessarily the way you want to. All right? You know, that, that's the whole idea of GUIs and IDEs, right? Is they make your life easier by doing some things for you. Well, that's all well and good when they do things the way you want them to. But if they do things in a, in a way that you don't want them to, then that's a problem. All right. So let's run this and we should get the drop down. That shows the list of customers and a button that doesn't really do anything yet. Now, the one thing that I always come back to is looking at the HTML that gets generated because I think that's, that's critical in understanding this. So if we look at the HTML for this, view source, we'll see that There's our drop down. That's its ID. That's the value. 
which is what? The customer ID, and that's the customer name. We have that for each of these fields. All right. So now it's time to put our detail view there. All righty. How are we going to do that? We're going to drag it and drop it in. All right. We were using a grid view before. This time we're using a details view. Now, in object-oriented terms, I'm sure both of those share a common ancestor. All right. Because a lot of the behaviors of the details view are the same. So a details view acts a lot like a grid view. It's just oriented differently. Instead of showing things going across in a table, it shows one item. And again, we have a data source. Now, are we going to use the data source for the list? No, because the data source for the list shows everything. We don't want everything. We just want the one thing that was selected in the dropdown. So I want a new data source. Don't be fooled into thinking because both of these are pulling up customer information that they're both going to have the same data source. All right? The data source is more than that. In other words, you know, make a, you know, make a description in your mind of what needs to be in that data source. And in the case of the drop down, what needs to be in there is a list of all the customers. In the case of the details view, the one customer that corresponds to the customer selected in the drop-down. That's two different sources of data. It's two different data sets. All right. So SQL. I'm going to change that to detail. All right. The other one was list. Connection string. Not making a new connection string, remember. Specify a statement. What do you think this is going to look like? I'll give you the first part of it. Select star from customer where, where what? Pick the source. Customer ID equals question mark. Customer ID equals question mark. So again, this is a parameterized query. What do I want? I want one particular customer ID. Oh, I'm sorry, one particular customer. Which customer do I want? I want the customer that corresponds to the ID that was selected in the dropdown. That's going to be different, right? I don't know what that is. I can't hard code a value. I don't want customer number three or whatever. I want it to be that dropdown. Yes? Well, in the dropdown, we're going to see their name. Yes. Okay, why don't I have customer name equals question mark? Again, if you remember, when we look at the drop down, when we pulled that up before, remember that you saw that there was the customer name and then there was a value attribute on the option. And that value was the ID. All right, so the name is what displays in the drop down, but the ID is also there too. All right, and remember, the ID is the better way to do it because the ID has to be unique, whereas the name, there could be the potential for the name not to be unique. All right. Now, what is going to be on the next screen? Pardon me? Pick the source of where that question mark comes from. Where are we getting the value of this parameter? And where are we getting it from? We're getting it from a control. Which control? The drop down. Now, if we look at this more closely, it says drop down list selected value. Well, the selected value is going to be the value of it and not the display 
the display text for it. So that is going to use the ID and not the name. So, go in and run this. First guy comes up, right? Why? Because the first guy selected. All right, so it shows me that. If I want another one, I select that and click the button, and I get Mary, Fred, and so on. Now, it's a little awkward because I have to go in and click this and then click that. How can I make it where I don't need the button? Use the auto post back. If I just get rid of the button, then it's not going to work. The reason it's not going to work is because that code only executes when I go back to the server. So I haven't gone back to the server without the button now. Unless I make this an auto post back. <laughs> and so now I go and pick Mary, and there she is. Now, again, this is where, uh, you know, this is the technical side versus the design side of this. There's a couple of behaviors on this page that we may or may not like, right? Number one is the first person shows up automatically. All right. Do we want that? Well, I don't know. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Um, if we don't want that, what we could do is we could put a dummy entry in there. We won't do that today, but we could put a dummy entry in there so that the first one that showed up would be a dummy entry. The other thing is, do you want it to automatically submit when you change that? That also depends on, on a lot of things, like how long it takes to do a query in this database. You know, is it going to, every time you make a query, are you going to sit there for 15 seconds while it goes and retrieves it? Or is it going to be pretty instantaneous? So all these are sort of like design questions that you have to ask yourself, you know. With this, just like with basic web design, there's the technical questions of how do I do this, then there's the design issues that say, is it a good idea to do this? All right, and you sort of have to decide uh, both ways. All right, we're not going to get through the whole example here today, but I want to do one more piece of it. And that is, I want to put in the number of calls. All right, the number of calls. Now, we know how to pull all the calls for the person, all right? We could do that in a matter of seconds, right? Okay, maybe not seconds. Well, it would be a matter of seconds. It just might be like 500 seconds, all right? I could put another grid view here, and I could make a new data source. for the calls, <coughs> new connections, or no new connection string, and I could say select star from call where customer ID equals what? Yeah, that's the answer for everything, right. And well, if you think about it, you know, what's the question mark? Question mark means it's an unknown, right? Do we know what customer ID we want when we're writing this? No. That's going to be decided at runtime. So we simply need to tell the SQL statement where you're going to get your value from. And where are we getting our value from? From the control, from the 
drop down. And we can test this. Finish. Now, Bob Jones doesn't have any calls, but if we go to Fred Smith, it shows Fred Smith and Fred's calls. Go to Mary, it shows Mary and her calls. All right. So that's how we that's how we kind of take the stuff that we did in the previous example and sort of extend it a little bit and 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 all that. All right. However, we don't want to see all the information about all the calls. Let's say we wanted to see just the count of the number of calls. And I'm going to leave this here, but I'm going to make another grid view to contain that. Now, I could do this a bunch of different ways. I could actually add the number of calls to this details view if I wanted to. All right? But I'm going to do it as a separate one just so that we get some more practice with creating detailed views and so on. All right? So, looking at the clock, I got four minutes left. Can I do this in ten minutes? No. Yeah, we can. Come on, have some confidence. It is black label Mountain Dew. Yes, it is. Really? Yeah. Which is funny because if any of you, I don't know if they even still have it. Bad boy. In the bookstore. What? This is like a college bookstore exclusive. What? <laughs> yeah. What? So. What does it taste like? It's Dew crafted with dark berry. It is a, it's a syrupy kind of, you know. Is it like voltage? But like. I don't know what that is. It's a blue mountain. I don't, I, I don't, I've never drank the Blue Mountain Dew, I don't think. If I did, I didn't like it, because I only had it once. I like the original Green Mountain Dew, the one that looks like antifreeze, all right? The the white frosty Mountain okay, Dew. Yeah, yeah. Voltage came out with the white frosty one. And the red one. Okay, the other ones that I've tried, I have not liked. And then I like pretty much all the Kickstarter. I have tried that. Yeah. Uh, I have tried that, but I want to get some sleep tonight, so. <laughs> All right. Well, of course, I'm not going to be able to do it in four minutes. We're going to talk about how to do All right. Yeah. What we want here is we don't want to see individual calls. We want to see a count of the number of calls. Does anyone remember the kind of SQL statement that gives us data about a group of rows as opposed to individual rows? Those are called aggregate functions. If you talk about an aggregate, aggregating something, or an, an aggregation of something, you're talking about a group of something. So, you know, each one of you would have, say, you know, uh, an average in this course. But the course average would be an aggregation, a collection of all of your averages. So, the simplest kind of aggregate function is a count. So I could say, select star, or select count star from call. What is that going to show me? Is it going to show me every individual call? No. It's going to show me how many calls there are in the table. How many rows there are in the table. Now, is that what I want here? No. Not exactly. What do I want here? Okay. Exactly. Where I, I don't want to see the count.
count of the number of calls, I want it broken down by customer. All right? So, in this case, specifically, I'm only interested in one customer. So I can say where customer ID equals what? I don't know. Question mark. There you that's going, to, that's going to work for a good part of this class, all right? Uh, if you don't know, just say question mark, all right? Okay, so what will this do? This will limit the calls considered to be only the calls that match that particular customer ID. And it's not going to show me every individual call, because this is what we had before. Select star from call where customer ID equals question mark. That showed us a detailed listing of every call. If I say select count star, that's going to give me an aggregate function. It's going to give me not the individual calls, but the number of calls. So let's go and do that. No, what you could put in there is you could put the name of a column in there. Yeah, and th this this is a this is sort of confusing, but count star means count the number of rows. If I were to say equivalent to that would be count call ID, and that would count how many call IDs there are. Which is the same, you know, there's one call ID per row, so it would give me one there. Where it gets to be a problem is if there's a field that can be a null. All right? If there was a field, let's say, of the customer, say, uh, the customer uh, support rep that was handling that call. If that, was, if that was able to be null. If I said select count customer service rep ID, it would exclude any of the calls that had a null customer. Um, sales rep ID. So generally speaking, um, you're going to want an asterisk there because you just want to count the rows. The only time you wouldn't put an asterisk there is if you wanted to count rows that had a particular, uh, that, that, that had a value in a particular field. So if I wanted to see the assigned calls for a customer, I could do select count customer support rep ID. Okay, so let's go and do this. I'm going to add a, doesn't really matter here, I'm going to add a grid view. New database, SQL data source account. No new connection. Select count star from call where customer ID equals what? Question mark. Where does that question mark come from? Well, it comes from drop down list. So now we can run it and it'll show me that Bob Jones, this is Bob Jones information. They don't have any calls, so we don't see the call detail, but they have zero calls. Fred Smith has one call. Mary Johnson has two calls. Okay, what we're going to do next time is we're going to build on this so that we can actually click on that too. All right, so we can click on that too and make that a link to a page that will show us the detail of the calls. So we're going to get rid of this 
and put this on its own page. So we can see how many calls a customer has, but if we're interested, we can see then the details of those calls. We're going to take inventory. In fact, that would be a good exercise between now and then, is think about how this is different than that. Because still the same idea of parameterized queries and all that, but it's going to be a little bit different. All right, we'll see you in labs.